This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. One day you wake up and every channel and newsfeed is abuzz with the news, we've received an alien signal, beyond any reasonable doubt. What do we do next? All of our discussions on the Fermi Paradox on this show and by others is predicated on the notion that there's been no unambiguous extraterrestrial signal sent to us or overheard. There's a lot of proposed reasons for why this should be the case, ranging from aliens simply not existing to them landing here regularly and us just not seeing and believing it. One of the more popular reasons is just that we haven't really gotten good enough at looking and haven't been looking long enough to detect any of them by their own regular transmission, which might not even use radio waves, or that they are signaling us but we haven't gotten good enough to recognize it, or that they aren't signaling us because they haven't seen us yet. We'll be examining a few different scenarios today for what we might do if we either receive or spot an unambiguously intelligent signal from space. But let's start with that one. Our own radio signals have only penetrated about a light century out from Earth, which is not even a millionth of the volume of this galaxy, and that itself would be a region 8 times bigger than the smaller volume, close enough for them to have received a radio signal from us and for us to receive one back from them, half the distance and an eighth the volume to include the time for a return trip for a message. Assuming aliens don't really expand beyond their own solar system much, You could have over a million alien civilizations around the galaxy who still haven't heard of us but would cheerfully send a reply by tight beam laser once they did. Indeed if you emerged in a galaxy that was crowded with unique homeworlds, in which life had evolved on and yet was still absent of galaxy spanning empires who've claimed every star around them, it would tend to be proof that such approaches were ineffective in which case nobody is likely to be scanning the galaxy with super intensity for the sake of self-preservation or profit. None of your neighbors can send war fleets to you or offer you the secrets of practical space travel because they have neither, indeed it's unlikely they can offer you any useful technology because about the only way you could not have practical space travel to other stars would be if power, energy, proportion, and automation technology basically maxed itself out in the next few centuries, or honestly decades way shorter than the time frame for signals to travel between these civilizations after they spy each other's radio signals, especially if they're more like a thousand light years apart and not a hundred. And the reality is that they're not likely to have technologies in other fields that translate well over distance. Alien psychology or biology textbooks might be interesting and contain some gems, but probably not enough to convince your leaders to spend larger sums of money for better SETI gear. The galaxy is pretty quiet because alien civilizations mostly communicate to their distant neighbors by tight beam communication, like a laser, and probably only the nearest dozen or maybe hundred, relying on the long web of tight beam communications to pass interesting info along. An awful lot of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, is based around this notion or minor variations of it, that nobody out there is in a position to invade us because if they could, somebody already would have by now, over the billions of years we've been around. Nobody views us as a threat because in billions of years of civilizations existing in this galaxy, nobody has thus far figured out a way to be one. So they are not expecting us to have valuable new science or dangerous technology any more than we would expect some uncontacted tribe in the Amazon to show up one day with a new technology that nullifies ICBMs, or possessing sidearms that can shoot through tanks or take out supersonic jets. You would also tend to figure that even if somehow one of your neighbors did suddenly get that technology that changed the game, it would be more likely you would find out about it in time to react rather than be its first victim. Their nearest neighbors might be surprised but probably not to the point of getting no signal out, and even the sudden absence of signals would put you on guard and result in something like a vengeance camera, a distant satellite monitoring your world set to send a signal out to your neighbors if someone rapidly blitzed you, which would also have some deterrence value. Long before they've conquered the galaxy, everyone's been on high alert and been able to start getting good intel and just the knowledge that there was some new tech with certain observable properties would likely spur its reinvention elsewhere, given the thousands of years you would have to work on that problem. Someone suddenly inventing FTL might change that, although probably not, your odds are too good someone got their hands on one, 
a scout ship being damaged accidentally and recovered for instance with its partially intact warp drive, or even defected or ran off with the tech to start their own splinter empire. Even if not, our own situation would be a strange one as it assumes that such FTL technology just got discovered relatively recently compared to the age of the universe, which is really no different than our own usual approach to the Fermi Paradox of assuming intelligent civilizations are ultra rare and growing more probable as the universe ages, such that you've only got maybe a handful in our entire supercluster of nearly a million galaxies, let alone our own tiny corner of our galaxy. FTL is recent because only recently has anyone come into existence able to invent it. Now the original favorite solution to the Fermi Paradox was basically this one we've been discussing, life is pretty rare and intelligence rarer, but fundamentally that interstellar travel was essentially impossible in the practical sense. Civilizations are stuck on their world, maybe with a few interplanetary colonies that never really thrived any more than an arctic outpost or settlement might, and any interstellar colony was some economy crippling prototype that took centuries to get done and resulted in some weak dot or colony that never benefited its homeworld and diverged a lot over the centuries to come so you felt no special kinship to them and even worried you might have planted a threat on your border rather than the seeds of a galactic empire. And you still got doomsday weapons and if there's a finite chance in a given year you might use them, even just one in a thousand, well you've probably got a civilization lifetime measured in centuries the same short timescale it takes to get a message to even your nearest neighbor. That's basically the SETI 1.0 working premise, inspired by the state of play in the world of Enrico Fermi in the 1950s, having helped invent the nuclear bomb but died before the space race and moon landings, and after that it seemed more plausible we might find a way to get to space and stay there, which led to the belief that space colonization was possible and practical and thus it didn't matter if alien homeworlds averaged 10 light years apart or a hundred or a thousand or even a million, because those timelines are just so small compared to the billions of years our universe has been around to matter for the purpose of spreading outward and colonizing everything. This is essentially the Halt conjecture to the Fermi Paradox in the 1970s, and Michael Halt also coined the term Fermi Paradox. Channel regulars are familiar with this already but it bears repeating because if we get a SETI signal tomorrow by classic radio or laser beam, some unambiguous artificial signal that needs decoding, then the starting point on deduction switched back to Fermi's default view, but a bit more optimistic. We just got signaled by someone who probably does not have either FTL or practical space travel, or alternatively does have the ability to colonize or conquer but does not have the motivation for it and does not think anyone else does either, which would tend to imply they thought it was pure common sense and mathematical inevitability that folks would view it as a waste of time. In that last case, there's a good chance the signal, once decoded, would include the reasoning and historical evidence backing that claim, and in that case we obviously want to make our post seti action to be determining a confirmation of those claims. In their shoes, part of how I would do that on the front end is to include a lot of coordinates and frequencies for other folks signaling, including very distant and weak ones, which would mean old ones. That provides strong evidence you're either telling the truth or can fake signals from ancient and wide-ranging sources, which means you have them so surrounded that there's no real reason or need to lie. You essentially have a universe where your nearer neighbors were definitely aware your world existed and showed every sign of life by probably whatever their equivalent of the 22nd century was. The biosignature of a planet like Earth is just going to be too obviously visible to telescopes in the James Webb Plus Zone, and would long predate humanity, let alone electricity and radio, but they couldn't do much beyond that until the planet started showing a spike in radio waves. They didn't need to be able to hear and decipher those just to see the uptick and change in pattern, and that's their signal to build a new and focused telescope for that planet and funding a few astronomy departments to start watching it carefully for those signs, atmospheric central changes in the key major industry, and maybe those forced nuclear bomb tests, undeniable signs of technology. Note we were kind of sliding back and forth between what they probably do and what we would then do because the nature of this setup, this universe, is that everybody has already had eons to come up with the best strategy, and no one has an exclusive knowledge on it. As the first contact or your goal is either to scam this new civilization or to establish yourself as a trusted source of information, in the long term, 
and the only valuable coin you have to trade is information, and only those parts unique to your world, or your speed and veracity, of relaying on galactic gossip. To me, that tilts toward a network where everyone is agreeing to pass on galactic gossip unadulterated, because it's not a telephone line, just a web of type beams that information can pass along many paths on. So your neighbors will quickly notice if you're lying, relatively speaking considering light lag, and unlike gossip won't have too hard a time figuring out who started it. That may or may not include each civilization getting the glass beads treatment, conned by getting something they truly valued but didn't realize was dirt cheap elsewhere, which might be your older and closest neighbor racing to send you all the technological advancements they can offer and merely asking for your cultural and history files in return. We would trip over each other grabbing that deal, not realizing that we basically got scammed on what really pays the galactic scale, all that history, art, TV and so on, not that blasé tech everybody already has. Now, what's wrong with this theory? Well, first off, the whole reason we call it the Fermi Paradox is because this state of play now seems paradoxical. This was Fermi's perspective back when blowing yourself to smithereens seemed quite likely and getting to another world seemed quite unlikely. The paradox came when we started thinking those odds looked different. A universe where space travel is practical and life is common is not one where the galaxy is 13 billion years old and there's valuable real estate still lying around. It's not even one where Earth gets conquered. It's one where somebody was already colonizing this galaxy when Earth formed, and they snapped it up and terraformed it. So either the galaxy isn't covered in civilizations, or it is and we are nature preserve or experiment, variations of what we call the zoo hypothesis. In that universe it really doesn't matter what we do because we're seen as some emerging butterfly from its cocoon, or locust. They're either very glad we were on the scene and just decided now is the time to say hello, or the message they sent us is essentially either a flat warning about what we are and are not allowed to do, or an apology they're going to need to exterminate us to restore the preferred state of this world. We don't really need to plan for this scenario in advance because our reaction is too specific to the message content and circumstances and we're essentially stuck in an extremely confined and disadvantaged situation in terms of self-control. Even if they are throwing a celebration across this local region of the galaxy that Earth has finally spawned a wonderful new companion for them all, it's still going to be them essentially dictating the nature of the relationship for the foreseeable future, even if it's not just parental but full-on spoiled kid circumstances. The plan for after Seti is successful in this regard is to be the wise guest or child, polite, restrained, and patient while we put together information. Not the classic first day in prison where you pick a fight with someone to establish yourself in the pecking order. That might actually be the case but this isn't TV, unless you pick a fight with someone in your weight class and skill level you're going to either lose badly or imply weakness or fear by punching down too much. I could actually imagine something like that in a galactic prison yard, even one where folks were glad to see a new species emerge. There's not much we can say about alien psychology with any certainty, in truth, nothing, but the big three borrowed from the novel The Killing Star is that aliens will be survival oriented, won't be whips, and will assume both are true of anyone they encounter. Essentially nature tends to strongly favor aggression and for cooperation to occur so you tend to default to a social hierarchy built in some fashion around your skill, strength, brains, etc. and how aggressively and cleverly you use them, which in practice tends to mean some sort of limited fight or competition, not fights to the death and scorched earth policies. Emphasis on limited, and so if you are getting into a galactic prison yard throwing a volley of relativistic kill missiles at a neighbor followed by a homogenizing swarm of self-replicating mortar bots might be seen as way beyond cheating. The competition might be very ritualized and tournament-like, or hyper-aggressive but wish for it to take place in virtual reality, or it's essentially a non-violent sport or game like chess, and you are in trouble now because you've not only sent a war fleet but didn't even broadcast it for others to see, to the extreme irritation of your planet's sponsors who just lost tons of ad revenue. Heck, this entire universe we see around us might be a zoo, a virtual universe or pocket dimension made just for growing civilizations, 
and your ability to conquer or colonize it might be the price of admission to the real world. In any of these cases, a little patience and observation is wise. Plus, in this context, if you're new on the scene it's like being a toddler, not the guy who just left free adult life for prison life, though in a galactic situation like that, you're probably going to max out your tech and basic advancement very quickly and your neighbors presumably already have, because everyone is really just getting the gift or purchasing access to order research done millions or billions of years ago by others. Speaking of pocket or virtual universes though, we don't want to ignore the possibility that a SETI signal is coming from outside normal reality, or even just from so far away that there is no need to rush any action. It is entirely plausible that the nearest alien civilization is a billion light years away and sends messages by immense beacons powered by entire stars. Indeed, this is essentially the grabby alien scenario, which is the default view of this show, that we're not only alone in this galaxy but there's only maybe a few thousand alien empires arising in the whole universe, each of whom will be able to sweep out and colonize thousands if not millions of galaxies before bumping into anyone, and many quadrillions of stars. Their beacon probably says something like, Hello, we're an empire of a few million stars spreading across our galaxy and we still haven't detected anyone ourselves, and have pretty much given up on FTL, our ships move at 80% of light speed and we think that's the effective maximum, so we took a few spare solar systems and converted them into beacons. We wish you well but when you hear this in many millions or even billions of years, please be aware that we, in any sane sense of the meaning we, don't really exist anymore and the leading edge of our colonization wave moves at 80% light speed and are as divergent from us and each other as you are from dinosaurs and oak trees, so good luck and hopefully neither you nor we have been wiped out by our own divergent colonies or descendants since then. Obviously in a case like that there is no scramble to reply or react, and that is true in almost every case for getting a SETI message you probably don't even need to send a reply in a hurry, that first one can be as simple as, thank you, we will think on this and get back to you. There is no real advantage to rushing. The same applies to METI, also called active SETI, sending signals rather than just listening for them. For my part I think there's just about zero risk to active messaging as opposed to just listening, but I still view it as a bad idea on principle. Note that this is not a decent Fermi Paradox solution. Pausing many years or even decades to reply to messages isn't not responding, nor is being quiet and listening going to result in everyone doing that indefinitely. You're a child in the galaxy's dark forest, if you hear nothing, odds are there's nothing to hear because no one exists to speak, but you still wait until you've had time to expand and really think on options before just shouting around and potentially attracting a wolf. This does not mean everyone does that forever, but even a few centuries of contemplation wouldn't mean much on the galactic stage, unless folks tended to blow themselves up in under a few centuries on average. But a good active message to send is always tailored to the target, and probably what we would get. Folks might do the high-powered omnidirectional beacon, but more likely they send out signals to plants that they think could have life and you up your odds for a reply by making sure they know it was addressed to them. Same as you get around spam filters and such by including personalized data in a message, you might send your message to that planet by laser and post it with a ratio of their planet's year and day length, so we might expect to get a message that had a break every 1024 bits of data being nicely binary, 2 to the 10th power or maybe 1080 or 1920 because that's our default image size these days, and that break or pattern says a new line of the image is beginning, they might send us images that were 365 pixels wide and paint a picture of the planet or solar system with that. And the upside there is that it's not a wild call into the night but rather knocking on someone's door, or even the window of their dining room while they're eating. It says, you might as well reply because I absolutely know you live here. You can double down on that if you've been able to monitor their planet well enough to decode their languages too, in which case the message might be 365 by 24 pixels and just read, Hello Orth, tune in to 109.7 FM for our introductory message. 
So that's the plan in terms of responses, you start by patience and not rushing to reply, and you ask yourself first and foremost what the message tells you about the state of affairs in the universe, or multiverse, and the folks sending the message. And one thing it tells you up front is that conversation is useful, which means diplomacy is at least on the table, otherwise they would never have sent a message, and that is valuable information. You can add that to what you know, which is probably that they are survival oriented, good at it, tough, and either unwilling or unable to just roll over and consume the entire galaxy, or they did but left pockets alone for some reason, maybe they don't like crushing primitive wars with unique life, but they also might view intelligent civilizations as friends or unwanted rivals. Patience and humility are in order, but cowering and cowardice probably are not. And patience should never be confused with being frozen and unwilling to act. Which takes us to discuss what the effect here on Earth is of such a message. This is a popular topic of course and for lots of folks it's when not if, and I really would stress that notion of patience and humility but not cowering or cowardice. I think we tend to assume half our population would go insane on finding out about alien life and the other half would fall on their knees and worship their new, enlightened overlords. Personally, I don't think that would happen much. I'm not saying you wouldn't have folks suddenly blow their brains out or start worshipping aliens, and trying to modify their behavior or even appearance to match aliens, people already do that, but I don't see it as a mass effect. Alternatively, I would be worried about governments or news agencies thinking it might happen and trying to control the narrative to cushion the blow or avoid fumbling attempts at cultural change. I don't think this would result in trying to hide it. You might be able to pull off modest concealment for a few days while confirming it because lots of groups who might not usually be okay with protected censoring might still go along with keeping things quiet until there was a definite confirmation of an unambiguously alien signal. Getting NASA or other space groups and big news groups to keep hush for 72 hours pending determination and preparations is very different than saying, tell no one until we say otherwise, or else. Because everyone is expecting leaks and rumors right from the get go, and those actually can cushion the impact to the public too. Why would speculation for a few days without formal confirmation eases things in a bit? In the long run, which in show context means centuries or even longer, any effort at concealment or shaping the narrative is going to erode away, so it might not matter much, but I think people miss a lot of what the real responses would tend to be. First, yeah it's going to be a big news item for a bit, and chat at every water cooler and social media group for a time, with talking heads on every news channel and lots of organizations we try to figure out how it impacts them or how to adapt or profit from the change. Figure on lots of sermons, from the literal Sunday morning kind aiming to match up or examine the theological impact, to the informal variety you get from that one friend or guy at the bar who has an authoritative opinion on everything, and none of them really agreeing. This is a good thing because if everybody was giving identical interpretations, especially if it was, wow we are screwed, that would tend to drive wild behavior. We often joke that after a week it would be old news, but that's not really the case either. This isn't that celebrity that did something scandalous, and people remember that years later and still talk about it too. For recent examples, think COVID-19 or the war in Ukraine, neither was old news a week later, because they were real news, life-changing stuff not entertainment. The moon landing wasn't old news a decade and a half later when I saw it over and over again as a kid on MTV all the time, back when that was the clip they play after commercials before the next music video, back when MTV played music videos anyway. The big stuff doesn't go away, and ironically this is where saturation and apathy, which we normally bemoan people getting, is actually a saving grace. We all wired up to get back to living life and that's probably worth remembering next time you're upset at how people don't seem to care enough or forget about something that you think matters a lot. It probably does, but if people didn't do that, we would be crippled by every shocking event and every death in our family. For a species that had to accept death being so commonplace that you would be counted a success if you got to live long enough to have gray hair and watch half your children die before they had children of their own, 
The ability to just keep going after a big shock is a must-have. In that context discovering aliens would be both big news that died off a lot after a few weeks and that thing that dragged on for years that people couldn't stop talking about even when and where you really wish they wouldn't. So my own advised plan for if we got a steady success would be a variation on keep calm, all is well. It is a big deal but be patient, what we know has changed but the situation itself has not. There's no rush while we decide what to do, life goes on. Now the exception to that is that that steady success is coming in the form of a flying saucer landing at the UN or a message arriving from their armada demanding our surrender and tribute. In a situation like that you might as well remain calm and try to act like an ethical and courageous person because if you're still alive after the fact then it would be nice to remember that you had kept your act together and it would probably help you and those around you at least a little. If they blast the planet it won't really matter if you were cowering in terror or nobly staring death in the face, unless there's an afterlife, in which case the latter is probably the better pick. I know which I'd prefer, but you do you, and honestly it's not likely to have any real impact on the situation. Unless they're here in some sort of Valkyrie-like role, picking the brave and culling the weak, or harvesting ideal subservient specimens for a slave race, and in neither is a prepared plan by us as a civilization likely to matter at all, you just go out and meet fate on your own terms. Now the good news is that while the Fermi Paradox is still too mysterious to draw anything like a certain opinion, what little evidence we have, mostly by deduction, would indicate that the most likely steady successes of our lifetime would either be an exoplanet hitting the marks for biocentrals in the atmosphere, as opposed to technocentrals or active signaling, implying a world with life but not advanced technology, or an astronomical hit on a distant Dyson Swarm or collection of them. Picking up a few hundred Dysons in a group might indicate civilizations expanding the interstellar way for a while, then stopped in favor of some alternative approach to progress, or died off and thus weren't a threat to us, while picking up several galaxies together that had gone dark into the infrared would indicate the grabby alien scenario was probably in play, and that's actually a good sign for us, see that episode for details. All in all, the big takeaway plan for SETI, for now, is simply patience. Patience if and until it succeeds, because we should always keep our eyes open out there, and patience if SETI does succeed, in gathering more information before acting on it. That seems to be the theme for space, whether it's SETI or multi-century journeys to new stars, or decades of achingly slow progress on returning to the moon or getting to Mars. Patience is a virtue, as it is in so many other things, and while often frustrating, it tends to pay off in the end. If you're interested in learning more on SETI and Drake's equation there's a great show, The Search for Life, The Drake Equation, over on Curiosity Stream. Also, shortly after writing this episode I got asked how I would go about doing SETI and I thought that might make some good bonus content for this episode over on Nebula. As regular viewers know, we often do extended editions of episodes over on Nebula and usually I've done these as 5-10 minute add-ons to episodes on the back end replacing the sponsor segments, as everything on Nebula is ad and sponsor free, but the feedback is that folks prefer the bonus content be readily available and separate to make it easier to find, so we'll start posting the bonus content as their own companion videos on Nebula going forward. That is one of the things I love about Nebula, the largest creator-owned streaming service which I'm rather proud to have been a founding member of, and which our audience helped succeed. The platform is all about serving the creators and audience and adjusting as needed, including great features like being able to swap out videos with errors and actually talking to live humans on our tech team, which is something YouTube never seems to care about. If you'd like to join Nebula and help support our show while you're at it, every new episode of SFIA comes out there a few days early and without ads or sponsor reads, and we have bonus content released exclusively there at least once a month. We also have an audio-only version of our show available there too, early and ad-free, as a podcast, as well as all of our extended editions and bonus content like we'll be having today, and some Nebula exclusives like Plants vs. Megastructures and the Coexistence with Aliens series. 
Now you can subscribe to Nebula all by itself, but we've also partnered up with CuriosityStream, the home of thousands of great educational videos like The Drake Equation, that lets us offer Nebula for free as a bonus if you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in our episode description. Again, you can get CuriosityStream and Nebula for less than $15 a year, just use the link in the episode's description. So today we talked about what if SETI succeeds in finding alien civilizations, and next week we'll flip things around and ask what if we never get that message, because humanity is the first civilization to ever arise in the whole universe. Then next weekend is our Sci-Fi Sunday episode on interplanetary conflicts and civil wars, and two Thursdays from now we'll contemplate how we might go about farming our new planets, like Mars. Then in three weeks we'll look at the controversial idea that our whole universe might be a black hole, and also if it would be possible to retreat into black holes in this universe and live inside them. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell. And if you enjoyed today's episode and would like to help support future episodes, please visit our website IsaacArthur.net for ways to donate, or become a show patron over at Patreon. Those and other options like our awesome social media forums for discussing futuristic concepts can be found in the links in the description. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.